I'm Effie Parks. Welcome to Once Upon a Jane, the podcast. This is a place I created for us to connect and share the stories of our not so typical lives. Raising kids who are born with rare genetic syndromes and other types of disabilities can feel pretty isolating. What I know for sure is that when we can hear the triumphs and challenges from others who get it, we can find a lot more laughter, a lot more hope, and feel a lot less alone. I believe there are some magical healing powers that can happen for all of us through sharing our stories, and I'll take all the help I can get. Once Upon a Gene is proud to be part of Bloodstream Media. Living in a family affected by rare and chronic illness can be isolating, and sometimes the best medicine is connecting to the voices of people who share your experience. This is why Bloodstream Media produces podcast, blogs, and other forms of content for patients, families, and clinicians impacted by rare and chronic diseases. Visit bloodstreammedia.com to learn more. Hello, rare friends. Thank you so much for being here. Every time you press play, follow, share, leave a review, anything, it helps this show grow. You're a part of making the magic happen, so let's keep it up and get this show into the ears of those who need to hear it. In the words of the great Jordan Harbinger, we rise by lifting others. I have a mama bear on the show today, and she has an 18-year-old daughter with something called laryngeal cleft primary ciliary dyskinesia, PCD for short. That 18-year-old girl, she's been through dozens of surgeries and hospital stays. Everything she ate and drank was leaking into her lungs because her cilia doesn't move the liquid, so she was basically drowning. This mother and daughter have been active advocates for this disease in speaking, writing, support groups, and they've also been helping to fundraise for the PCD Foundation. And one of their initiatives is to get a PCD clinic at major hospitals in every state. They have just kept fighting for more research and better treatments and hopefully a cure. And like everyone, you know, they relish in the good days and try to focus on the positive things that they can do. Her daughter's off to college now, and today we're talking about a lot of the stress and grief of that shift of her as a full-time caregiver to perhaps a more complicated realm of caregiving from afar. She's oh so vulnerable, and I know so much of her story will resonate with you. Please enjoy my conversation with Karen McEwen. Hello, Karen. Welcome to the show. Hi, Effie. Thank you so much for having me. Excited to be here. Yes, it's my pleasure. Your first podcast. I'm looking forward to learning about you and your family. Yes, I'm very excited to, to share my story and really share my daughter's story and, and what we've been through. And hopefully we can help other families out there. Yes, yes. Well, you've been through a lot. So we have a lot to cover in our in our 30 minutes or so. Let's get started. Tell me a little bit about your family and your daughter, Elena. Okay, yeah. So my daughter, Elena, she is 18 years old, and she is a freshman in college. And she has a rare disease called primary ciliary dyskinesia, also known as PCD. And I also have another daughter, Madison. She is 11 years old, and she does not have PCD. Um, she is healthy and a little spitfire and just love her to death. So when Elena was born, right away when she was born, she did not cry at first. She coughed. And as soon as she coughed, I just felt something inside of me saying there's something wrong with her. And I always say that's my first uh, mother's intuition about the journey that we were just about to embark on. And the doctors listened to her and they said her lungs were a little junky, but you know, that was probably from the fluid from the birth and nothing to be worried about. Two days later, I took her to the pediatrician just for our normal checkup, and they said her lungs were still junky and chunky, and to go to the doctors to get an x-ray. And from that day on, it's just been medical chaos with her. Just constant pneumonias, constant bronchitis, ear infections, sinus infections, just a lot of upper respiratory problems. In Elena's 18 years here, she has had over 60 surgeries. She's been hospitalized over 100 times. And a couple years ago, um, she had to get hearing aids as the disease has stolen her hearing. And she's just been very resilient throughout all of this. 
our journey started right when she was born, and we traveled to a variety of different states trying to figure out uh, what was going on with her. PCD is so rare that most doctors hasn't even heard of it. When she was four, we finally got the diagnosis of primary ciliary dyskinesia. We had traveled to University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, where they have been uh, the leaders in PCD research. And she was tested for that down there, and that uh, turned out positive. But before we went to North Carolina, one of her doctors thought that maybe she had a laryngeal cleft or a fistula or something going on with her swallowing that was causing her to aspirate into her lungs. She had had multiple swallow studies and she had been scoped, I don't know how many times, just back and forth with all these different doctors and hospitals. We traveled to Boston Children's Hospital and they diagnosed her with a laryngeal cleft. She had been tested for that multiple times, it had been missed. So after we got that diagnosis, um, I spoke to her doctor here in Michigan where we live, and he said, oh, well, that, that makes sense that, you know, all of her symptoms, that makes sense that she's aspirating into her lungs. And he said, are you still going to travel to North Carolina? Because that was going to be a month after we were in Boston. And just something deep down inside of me thought, yeah, I think we should. And he said, well, both of these conditions are so rare. There's no way, there's no way she can have both of these rare conditions. And I thought, well, you know what? We have the appointments. I feel like we're getting some answers here. We're going to go on track and, and do this. So we went to North Carolina probably about a month later. Uh, they tested her for PCD. It took a couple months for it to come back, and that came back normal as well. So with primary ciliary dyskinesia, the little hairs um, that line your nose, throat, lungs, and ears, they're supposed to move back and forth to uh, get rid of the mucus. And some people with PCD have the little hairs, they just don't move. And some people with PCD don't have the hairs at all. So Elena, she does have cilia, but they just don't move back and forth. So with her, since she had the laryngeal cleft, Everything she was eating and drinking was leaking into her lungs. And then with her lungs not having the cilia to remove the mucus, she was basically drowning from the inside. And we had the laryngeal cleft repaired in Boston. And even with that, the symptoms maybe improved a little bit, but it was still constant chaos. Just with PCD, just the constant, with that cilia not moving, She's always just prone to infections in her ear, sinuses, and lungs. And that's one reason why she lost her hearing is because she had so many ear infections. I think she had like 17 set of ear tubes when we just finally got to the point where, you know, this, I don't think this path is going to continue to work. We should probably look at on, you know, look at to getting hearing aids moving forward. Oh my gosh. This is a lot, Karen. I hear a lot of diagnostic odyssey stories, but I especially feel so, I don't know what it is. I feel so sad for the kids who were even just 10 years ago, 14 years ago, 18 years ago, when so much of the buzz about zebras and diagnosing rare disorders and the genetic diagnosis series in general wasn't as accessible or even there. That was a lot for your family. Right. I mean, it was a lot. And for me, I, you know, did not have a medical background. And I just remember sitting in these doctor's appointments, like a deer in headlights. They're saying things, you know, like laryngeal cleft, aspirating, pulse ox numbers, you know, just all of these medical terms. I had no idea what they were talking about. And all I knew is I was beyond exhausted. I don't, I hadn't slept at all. And just terrified. I was a first time mom, and that's stressful enough. And I had this extremely sick child that no one knew what to do with. I mean, I thought when you had a sick kid, you went to the doctor, they figured it out, and they moved on, you know, and then off we go. But it obviously it did not go that way. So when Elena was born, they didn't have any PCD mutations. 
within the past 18 years, they now have 44 known mutations. And thankfully, um, one of the ones that they found is one that Elena has. So I know they are doing research and studying on that. But compared to like cystic fibrosis, cystic fibrosis, I think, has over 2,000 mutations. So there's still a lot of research to be done on PCD. While PCD and cystic fibrosis have the same symptoms, the underlying cause is, you know, very, very different. The mutation's very different. So, I mean, I am thankful for that. Within the past 18 years, there has been, you know, research done and things are, are moving forward with that. But there, we still have a long ways to go, a very long ways to go. Yeah. The cilia not moving or being absent entirely is really interesting. And I hadn't heard of PCD or even how those types of things show up in that way. That must have been really painful for her. And probably she was unable to express that. But I know just from hearing about stories from others in the cystic fibrosis community of what it feels like to kind of feel like you're drowning. Right. hundred percent. I, again, I never heard of cilia either. I mean, again, I'm don't have a medical background, first time mom. And I was just like, what are you talking about? Like what, what is happening here? What is the cilia? And not only is cilia, you know, responsible for getting rid of the mucus and everything with the research that they have shown is that the cilia is actually responsible for organ placement when babies are in the embryonic stage. Because 50% of um, patients that have primary ciliary dyskinesia, their organs are on the opposite sides. Whoa. Yeah. Elena does not. Organ placement. Yes. Wow. Yes. I, I remember cilia from science class yeah. and it being those little like anemone moving things and that it would clear out things. But wow. Organ placement. Yes. Yes. I had no idea. And yes, with the research I've been studying, now, Elena does not have. Elena's organs are on the right side. But yeah, 50% of PCD patients, um, their organs are reversed. They're on the opposite sides. Well, Elena's case is studied in a few different um, university hospitals. But, you know, they had research for a while that perhaps she had the laryngeal cleft because her organs weren't developing correctly because she did have PCD. Our kids being diagnosed with this more easily now? I would hope so. I know that I have volunteered with the uh, PCD Foundation. They're located in Minnesota. And one of their main goals that they've had for uh, the last several years as, is they want to set up a PCD clinic in every state. And it would be similar to the cystic fibrosis clinics that are set up in hospitals. Because when you diagnose for PCD, the samples that they have to take from the nose, it's just very precise and you need to have a certain type of microscope. You need to preserve the sample in a Petri dish. It's just, it's a very delicate and intricate situation. So with a foundation, that's one of their main goals is to get a clinic in every state, obviously get a clinic, you know, in every country throughout the world, and just to have a better diagnostic procedures. Now, when Elena was diagnosed, she's been being seen at University of Michigan Mott Children's Hospital. We have been going there now um, since she was four. So for the past 14 years, and needless to say, I've become extremely good friends with her pulmonary doctor, her ENT doctor, the audiologist, the amazing staff on uh, 12 East, where we're always hospitalized. We're always in 12 East when we're up there. So we know them very, very well. And uh, her pulmonary doctor, I just consider one of my, my great friends. And uh, several years ago, at one of Elena's appointments, I had mentioned that the foundation wanted to put these clinics in, and I thought that it would be great to have a clinic right here at the University of Michigan Mott Children's Hospital, and could we go ahead and put a clinic in? And in my mind, I had all of these reasons, you know, to tell him why if he told me no. And he looked at me and he said, okay, let's do it. What do we need to do? Yeah. <laughs> what do we need to oh, do? I love knowing that you became friends with them too. That's really special. Yeah. So he went ahead and I said, well, I can't really do anything because I'm not the doctor. But he went ahead and he worked with the foundation. He hired, uh, you know, the director of the facility. His name's Dr. Tom Saba. He's an amazing, amazing clinician. Um, 
you know, we see him all the time also with, you know, working with Elena and, you know, Elena and I then started fundraising um, for Mott Children's Hospital to help them get money to buy the equipment that they needed for the clinic. And then Mott became involved in some clinical trials and Elena was old enough at the time and met the, the needs. She already had gone through the clinical trials at Mott. Mott has hosted um, PCD family nights at their um, hospital. Elena and I have been asked to speak there. We've spoken there at a few different meetings and conventions that they've had. Unfortunately, Elena has been hospitalized for a few of them because she was sick, but I was there. Uh, we've spoken at uh, medical schools um, at Michigan. We've spoken at rare disease day events, actually here in our state at our local capital, as well as at Michigan. And yeah, so just really trying to raise awareness and and not have people have the bumpy roller coaster loop de loop journey <laughs> that we had, just trying to get diagnosed and preach. Yeah, and just trying to trying to figure out, you know, how how this journey is going to go. Has Elena had any unnecessary procedures with all of the stuff done, or is that just kind of the nature of her disease? She did have her tonsils and adenoids removed when she was, I think, when she was two. I mean, that wasn't a big, huge surgery. We were hoping that maybe that would help things. I would say at the end of the day, that probably didn't need to be done. But other than that, just getting a diagnosis was so difficult. It was just grasping at straws. I mean, like I said, she was scoped, gosh, maybe 10 or 12 times by different doctors, different medical facilities, you know, looking for a fistula or looking for a cleft. But I guess, again, that's a very intricate procedure, difficult to diagnose. And we were referred to go to Boston because they were the leaders of finding the cleft. We saw a specific doctor there that that was his specialty, was finding the cleft. And he did. He found it on the first scope. And then same thing with going to UNC, that they were the specialty on uh, PCD. And that's why we went there. You know, and again, they had found these lipin-laden macrophages in her lungs, which I guess re- is a result of aspirating. So she was on a lot of, um, you know, just did a lot of swallow studies, a feeding tube. Maybe we did more than we should have. Maybe I should have switched doctors. I know at one point I stayed with a couple doctors too long when she was a baby. I should have switched beforehand. But again, you know, just trial and error and, and figuring all of this, you know, stuff out, this medical stuff out. Yeah, I think we can all relate to that. Right. Especially just not knowing when to move on or if you are allowed to move on. And also just the bandwidth, right, of like constantly searching and constantly fighting. It takes a toll. And then you leaving to different states all the time. I can imagine the financial burden that that adds on to a family when they're just trying to help their child. Oh, right. A hundred percent. Right. Because we had to, you know, pay for the hotel rooms and just right. Everything that that comes comes with that, you know, the lodging, the food, you know, all of that, you know, it, it does. it. Yeah, it does. It, it adds up. But, um, you know, at the end of the day, we're like, you know, she, she deserves better. Like this, this is, you know, severe. Um, we have to we have to figure this out to give her some type of quality of life here, because while she miraculously never had failure to thrive, which is still astounding. She met her milestones. Um, She was always, you know, right on track for her growth and everything, you know, doesn't really have any uh, learning disabilities or anything like that. You know, going through school, we did have a private tutor for her just because she was absent probably 50% of the time. So, you know, I take that as, you know, a blessing, I guess I you know, look both ways, you know, there's certain things she can't do, but there are certain things that weren't affected. It, you know, just, just going back and forth, just trying to to focus on the positives of, of what she can do. Yeah. And you've all worked so hard to get where you're at. I mean, I, I hear this as such a success story in front of all of that pain and stuff that you've went on. And I'm so interested in how 
this empowers her now, you know, she's a young adult at this point and she was advocating for herself as a teenager. Yes. hundred percent. I mean, she is, she's a rock star when it comes to this. I mean, when she was a baby, her doctor used to call her happy Weezer. I mean, she would be struggling to breathe. She would have all of these lines on her, <laughs> oxygen on her. Oh, now I get it. <laughs> and he, and she is wheezing up a storm. This child has wheezed every day from when she was born. She, her lungs have never been clear. She has wheezed every single day since she's been born. But she was always happy. Like her doctor would say, she's a happy wheezer. I mean, <laughs> it, would, it was just crazy. She's just, you know, all these oxygen tubes are on her, you know, and, and she would just be laying there just smiling around and, you know, at school, wheezing and coughing up a storm and always had a smile on her face. Wow. Yeah, just... You know, and just being resilient and just, I don't know, taking it, taking it all in stride. And um, when she was a teenager, she started um, a teen support group on Instagram. And social media is very good in, in certain ways because um, there is a support, a PCD support group on Facebook that I had joined. And there are a lot of parents out there, you know, like, oh, you know, I have a daughter, I have a son um, looking to talk to other kids with PCD. And I was telling Elena about that. And she's like, oh, well, maybe I could start like a group chat or a support group or something. And so she went ahead and took it upon herself and set up this support group on Instagram. And I, you know, put it out there on, on the PCD Facebook. And I just let the other parents know. I said, you know, at this time, it's just kind of a, a platform for kids. I'm not even on there. I'm not following it. Um, you know, Elena will let me know if there's, you know, any bullying going on. I don't foresee that, but it's just a safe place for kids to talk about their disease and just talk about life and how frustrating it is. And so I think that was really helpful for a lot of kids. I know Elena's not really moderating it anymore. I'm not quite sure who took that over, but it is on Instagram. It is still um, up and running for that. And she was very, we did just a ton of fundraisers for PCD. When she was younger, we used to do these trick or treat walks. It was one of my favorite fundraisers. I love Halloween. Love our family loves Halloween, and just decorating this little park we would go to and getting donations for candy and cider and donuts. And you know, Elena would help me with that. And like I said previously, she came with me to speak about rare diseases. You know, at our state capitol and at universities and at these PCD events. You know, and she was just very involved in you know, helping others and helping raise awareness and just, you know, just keeps going. I mean, she, you know, has good days and bad days, but she would just, um, yeah, she just kept going forward and forward. And, um, you know, then uh, COVID hit and we had had a pretty good run of her health. It, you know, things had been stable. And I mean, that was terrifying for me. It was terrifying for our whole family because here we had a kid that was at the highest risk with this lung disease. Her lung function ranges, it's in the 40% range. She has so much scarring and damage to her lungs from the disease. That's where it is at this point. It's in 40% range. And here comes this disease that is attacking respiratory systems and nobody really knows about. I mean, my whole family hunkered down. We were just really, again, scared. It almost felt like when she was a baby again, like I just wanted to protect her and just don't go outside. Don't go around anyone. Just you need to stay here. And that affected all of us, you know, even her younger sister, you know, her younger sister when they were doing um, at home learning and stuff, you know, I didn't really feel comfortable for her going to someone else's house to do like a pod learning session because we were so worried about what was, you know, what could come home into our home as well. You know, so that just put another, another notch in our, in our journey, <laughs> on our PCD no journey. No kidding. I know how resilient and plastic these kids are, right? Yes. And how they just continue to be happy Weezers yes. all the time. <laughs> but it's also a testament to the circle of support they have around them sometimes too, you know, which is so amazing that your family was able to to be that way, to be that for her. But then I'm also like, 
But there is the hard stuff. There is the trauma. There is the uncertainty and the constant, the constant live wire. And to have to go back to feeling like she was a baby again and that trauma response that was probably activated in all of you must have been something, something different. Yes. I mean, as you know, when Alina was a baby, there were many dark days. I mean, I had, I would just cry all day because I just felt very alone and so scared. Like I would say, I would jokingly say it was joking, not joking. Like somebody could sneeze in Ohio and Elena would get sick. I mean, I didn't know what to do. And when she was a baby, you know, I had joined a mommy group, you know, because I was a stay at home mom and just to meet these other moms and just to have some type of social life. I could never go because she was sick. And I would look at all these, all these kids and, you know, kind of compare them to Elena. And I'm like, man, there is something, there's something going on with her. You know, I attended when I could, but then she would get sick again. And, you know, at the time I know everyone was, you know, they're trying to be helpful. Like, well, some kids get more sick than others. You know, maybe it's her immune system, but you know, she needs to be around other kids. You need to socialize her and this and this and this. And, you know, I was trying to do that, but then she'd get sick all the time. And I don't know, it was hard. I just felt like a failure as a parent. Like I couldn't figure it out. Like, here's my child. I'm taking her to all these doctors. We're, we're trying to figure it out and she's not getting any better. And, you know, as a family, we're, you know, taking, we're going out of state and, you know, I'm giving her these breathing treatments just around the clock and I'm giving her chest therapy and I'm, you know, doing all these things and nothing is helping. And there were, it was very, very lonely. It was, um, you know, very, just very stressful. And then when COVID hit, same thing. It was just very scary that we just all needed to hunker down again and just be very careful about going forward and what we're going to do. So Elena did start college uh, this past August. And that was terrifying for me because the pandemic's not over. She was fully vaccinated and her college is about an hour and a half away from here. But she just said, she's like, I'm living my life. She's like, I'm just moving forward. I want to go to college. I want to live my life. I'm, I'm going to do this. And so she did. <laughs> she did. <laughs> and even with being absent all those times in school and being home for pretty much a year and a half, her senior year in high school, she only attended school in person one day. She graduated from high school, um, magna cum laude, president's honors, national honor society. I mean, the kid just nailed it. Even with everything she's gone through and in a pandemic, she graduated from high school with all these honors, moved away to school. And I will tell you, <laughs> I sat in the car and sobbed before I drove away. Uh, yeah, I'm sobbing with you. I would have to. <laughs> like hugging her goodbye. I was crying, of course. You know, my family was there and. They're like, she's going to be okay. It's going to be fine. And, you know, I went in the car again, sobbing. And I don't know, just again, mother's intuition. I just had this, I don't know, like something's off, this little bit of a, a, a bad feeling. But I'm like, I'm just, you know, anxious and she'll be okay. Well, two weeks later, I got the call. Mom, I'm really sick. I'm really sick. I need you to come here right now. I need to go to the hospital. And I'm just like, well, okay. It's going to take me an hour and a half to get to school. And then it's going to take me an hour to get to um, University of Michigan to the hospital. I said, can you wait that long or do you need an ambulance? And she's like, oh God, do not call an ambulance. Do not embarrass me. Do not call an ambulance. I'm like, it's not in about an embarrassment. This is your health. You know? And I said, is your roommate there? And she said, yeah, she's here. She's like, but come get me right away because I'm really sick. That was the longest hour and a half drive I ever made. It was so scary. While I was driving there, I was calling her doctor at Mott, telling him what's going on. Because again, we're in the pandemic and we tried to keep her out of the hospital as much as possible with the pandemic going on. You know, at this time she was fully vaccinated. I got up there and picked her up and then we went over to Mott. Um, we thought for sure that she had COVID even though she was vaccinated, but they did all the tests and everything and she didn't. 
She just was having what I call like a PCD flare up. She had pneumonia. She was in the hospital, I think for five days, and then was basically sick the entire first semester of school. She ended up having to be hospitalized again over Thanksgiving. She needed a bronchoscopy to clear out her lungs and then get some, I think it was five or six days of um, IV antibiotics and steroids. And this is very common for Elena. When she would get sick and be hospitalized, a lot of the times it ended up resulting in needing a bronchoscopy. As she got a little bit older, we were trying to, you know, be on the offensive instead of defensive. And during the summer, she would get a bronchoscopy and usually a new set of ear tubes and then be hospitalized for seven to 10 days with um, intensive breathing treatments, chest therapy, and steroids just to kind of clean out her lungs and give her the best chance of um, being able to fight off any infections. Uh, All I have to say is Elena's grounded. (laughs) I'm grounding her. (laughs) Man, you know, I think about her moving out too, right? And like what that must be like for you, not just because you're worried about her getting sick, Mm -hmm. but because you've been her constant constant caregiver and all of the other things for 24 hours a day for 18 years and to suddenly not be that that has to be kind of another wall of exhaustion that you kind of realize that you hit yeah it's been quite the experience I feel like I just got fired because (laughs) Even, so she turned 18 in August, and she had several doctor's appointments before she was going back to school. And we were getting, I don't know, I'd, I had said something to her like, oh, remember, we have, you know, your appointment tomorrow at one o'clock or something like that. And she said, you're not coming with me. I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, I'm 18. You don't need to come with me. She's like, I'm going to my appointments by myself now. And like, my heart dropped. And I was like, okay, because I'm very good friends with her pulmonary doctor. (laughs) He's one of my favorite people in the world. And now I'm not going to see him. This is hilarious. This is not funny, but it's so funny. (laughs) I know. And even like with her ENT doctor, I'm like, well, I want to know how her kids are. (laughs) And her audiologist and... She's like, yeah, you're not coming. And I mean, I'm such good friends with her pulmonary doctor. I mean, we text back and forth. And I texted him that day and I said, Elena told me I can't come to the appointments anymore. And he goes, what do you mean? (laughs) And I said, well, she's 18 and she wants to do this on her own. It was just very weird watching her pull out of the driveway because for 18 years, the hundreds of doctor's appointments that I've taken her to the hospitalizations, picking her up from school, just the chaos. And it was very weird to watch her drive away to her own appointments. Yeah, it's like we raised traitors. Yes, (laughs) that's what I felt like. You know, and when I tell my, you know, I was telling my friends this and, you know, of course I'm crying about it. And, um, you know, someone said to me, because I said, God, I feel like I got fired. And they said, well, don't take it as you got fired. Take it as you had a promotion. And I've thought about that for a while. And I'm like, well, promoted to what? Because when you get a promotion, you still have a job, you have more responsibilities, and you still are working. Like this kid just went off and running by herself. (laughs) I mean, she is 18. She has to sign, like when she was hospitalized in August and November, she has to sign the consent form. She has to sign everything because she's 18. She's an adult. Like I don't even fill out her forms anymore. You're like a silent board member. (laughs) Yes. 100%. I'm there. Yes. It's amazing what happens and how human beings adapt to situations like this. And it's uh, the level of difficulty just can't be understood. No, it cannot. And that's what I say. Unless you live through it, nobody can ever understand. And, you know, I've lost a lot of friends with you know, having a a child with a chronic disease, because everyone always thought, you know, I was overreacting, um, you know, making mountains out of molehills, you know, all this kind of stuff. But it's just like, at the end of the day, I mean, you see this kid is sick all the time. I mean, we're post from the hospital all the time. She's having all these surgeries, and she's having all this stuff done. 
And I just don't understand how, right, like I could be overreacting like with a sick kid and all this kind of stuff. And it did. I mean, it's just been just been a really just a challenging journey, you know, and even when she went to school, you know, that was that was challenging for her for her as well, because, you know, many of the kids knew, you know, that she had some type of, you know, medical thing going on. And she wasn't invited to a lot of birthday parties or invited to a lot of events because just the parents were worried about, you know, well, what if she got sick? You know, what if she got sick and they didn't know what to do? And I just remember this one time she did get invited to this birthday party and she was so excited and I was so excited for her. And of course she had gotten sick just a few days before and she was in the hospital. And I was talking to her doctor, her pulmonary doctor, who I'm still very good friends with. And I was telling him like, gosh, she finally got invited to a birthday party and she can't go because we're here. And he's like, you know, I think she can be discharged like a day early. He's like, I think it will be okay. You know, let's get her to this birthday party. And I just remember sobbing. (laughs) I just remember crying like, oh my God, you get it. You understand this. Like this means the world to her. You know, and her pulmonary doctor did several things like that when she was hospitalized because we were there so often, you know, whether it was giving her a day pass to go do something at school or go do this or go do that or work around her schedule. You know, I remember those things and I'll forever be grateful because he understood. He took it to heart and he he understood. What would you say in all of this or what are the things about you personally that kind of feels like a superpower now? Well, I guess that I can learn I can learn a lot of new things and do things that I never thought possible. Like, as I said before, I never, I do not have a medical background, do not know, did not know anything medically whatsoever. And just being on this journey with Elena, just learning about all of these medical terms, um, learning about how to care for her. Um, you know, cause she also had so long with doing breathing treatments, the thousands of hours of breathing treatments we give, you know, and then I had to give her back therapy and chest therapy for that. And then she had a pick line. Uh, she had several pick lines and that, you know, I was completely terrified and thought I was going to have a nervous breakdown because I did not want to deal with that. I, you know, I just thought there's no way I can handle it, but I think she's had like six pick lines and handled it every time. And then starting the PCD clinic at Mott and figuring out how to do fundraisers and what fundraisers would be successful and how can we get the community involved. And, you know, and one of my passions from that I've always had when I was younger was writing children's books. And I thought, well, you know, I never thought I'd be writing a children's book like this, but, you know, we worked on it and I still have the manuscript, you know, we need an illustrator and stuff, but, you know, taking things that, you know, I enjoy and trying to put that, you know, to the use of, of something good. So I guess at the end of the day, just, you know, I can, I don't know, I'm constantly evolving, learning, growing, doing things, speaking at conferences, which I never thought I would, speaking at medical conferences, speaking, you know, at our state capitol, just opportunities that I just never, ever thought I would be involved in. And just grateful for for the people that I've met along the way with the journey, the other PCD families that are out there. Elena's doctors. I've met just so many great people that have just touched our lives in the most positive way. And I'm I'm forever grateful for that. Yep. I'm over here nodding along to every single thing you said in that response. And I think I think we all kind of stun ourselves in our outlooks now and what we're capable of. Thanks so much for coming on the podcast today, Karen, and for talking about the last 18 years and your amazingly resilient, happy little Weezer. Yeah, my happy Weezer. (laughs) (laughs) And and I think that your story is going to really connect to a lot of people listening and hopefully make them think. And yeah, I just want to say thank you again for being my guest today. Yeah, Well, thank you so much for having me. I appreciate it. I hope you've been enjoying this podcast. If you like what you hear, Please share this show with your people and please make sure to rate and review it on iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. You can also head over to Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter to connect with me and stay updated on the show. If you're interested in sharing your story or if you have anything you would like to contribute, please submit it to my website at effieparks.com. 
Thank you so much for listening to the show and for supporting me along the way. I appreciate you all so much. I don't know what kind of day you're having, but if you need a little pick-me-up, Ford's got you.